A quick disclaimer before we get started, the opinions expressed by my guest today, Dr. Brandon Marin, are his own and do not necessarily represent those of his company, Intel. It's my pleasure to chat with Dr. Brandon Marin. Brandon has been an R&D engineer at Intel in Arizona since 2017. He earned his undergraduate degree in chemical engineering at the University of Southern California and his MS and PhD degrees at UC San Diego. At UCSD, he took the core curricula for both chemical engineering and nanoengineering and has hired many engineers from both disciplines in his current position. At Intel, he has authored a veritable phone book of patents and has recently won the Top Achievement Award given at the company. Brandon is actually a second-time guest on the show. In his first appearance, episode 18, he discussed his upbringing, struggles with addiction, homelessness, jail time, and rehabilitation, and ultimately rebounding to complete his his uh, interrupted bachelor's degree, starting and completing his PhD, along with one master's and most of a second, all while being completely clean for the last 13 years. So I would encourage all of you to check out that super inspiring uh, story that Brandon was um, was uh, was honest and gener generous enough to share with us. So Brandon, thank you very much for doing this. Yeah, thanks for having me, Darren. Pleasure to be uh, here again. Sure. Uh, what would you know about DIY natural gas plumbing that the average person wouldn't? <laughs> yeah, I think, um, well, I'll tell you one thing. I didn't learn much about it um, um, in, my, in my bachelor work or undergrad. I actually started learning about those things um, outside of, uh, of school. And um, the reason why actually the, the most I started learning about that was when I was your PhD student and uh, <laughs> when we um, installed that vacuum system, the Orion, which was like a combined thermal evaporator and a sputter system. And that kind of gave me an introduction into advanced vacuum systems. I kind of helped the, the company that gave us that piece of equipment, um, um, some direction on how to design it. And then uh, the plumbing- You helped them do their job. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, <laughs> for free. And then um, once the guy came over, I think you remember, I was hovering ab above the installer the entire time and helped him a lot with the install. There was some plumbing that needed to be optimized for the vacuum system. And, um, you know, our um, our awesome um, uh, basement tech, um, uh, his name escapes me right now, um, Wayne, Wayne Nielsen. Wayne. Yeah, he he uh, helped me with uh, all of the equipment uh, needed and tools, and then we we plumbed it right up. And then and then um, I've been doing DIY stuff at my for my mom and friends mostly uh, mostly car work. And then I recently installed a um, um, a gas tankless heater, uh, a la Breaking Bad, because <laughs> I saw Walter White get one. Uh, and I was like, oh, I wonder why everyone's so jazzed about these. And I, um, I installed it and uh, I learned a lot about piping, uh, hence why I know about the codes and um, exactly how to spec like a natural gas line um, as it goes from like the actual street line uh, to whatever piece of equipment you're using. So it's just random, uh, random stuff like that and other things are are um, reasons why I think I'm in the right field for engineering, you know, because it's that kind of stuff that interests me. And I think you you kind of said something that um, that resonated me when I first started. You're like, yeah, you're one of those engineers that really likes engineering, <laughs> so <laughs> really likes working with his hands. So, so yeah, that's a lot. There's a lot of random things like that. Um, elect um, electricity work, like just um, basic electricians work. Um, my uh, lights are uh, are smart lights, so I had to um, install all those myself and other things like auto work um, and roofing is something I also know how to do now. And it's just uh, stuff you just pick up along the on the way as an engineer, and it's pretty uh, pretty easy to kind of pick up on it nowadays with all the YouTube videos and all the the DIY stuff available online. But yeah. I find we were talking about this by by text message when we were setting up this meeting, but yeah. that I think both of our ideal weekends involve a trip to Home Depot or Lowe's, <laughs> and right. uh, I never would have predicted that about myself. Um, I don't I don't know if you feel the same way, uh, but in part I think it's because I'm not actually using my hands anymore in the lab, <laughs> right. and uh, it's a way to continue to do like 
actual quasi engineering uh, at home when it's all very theoretical uh, in the classroom. Yeah, there's something cathartic about it too, right? Like just updating something yourself and then figuring it out, like the actual problem solving and the solution and implementing it. That's There's something really satisfying about that, even if it is some random thing for your home. I, I, I like that, yeah. <laughs> Although I feel that as I learn more, I look back at old jobs that I did and think of how much better I could have done them now. Um, like who knew they sold drywall texture in a can, right? And I've got all right. these like, you know, spackle knife smears on my walls everywhere that I've painted over. And right. I kick myself every time. Yeah. But <laughs> yeah. Or snap on plumbing fi um, fixtures, uh, fittings too. Like you can snap them on now and they're like perfectly fine as opposed to soldering them, which there's a bunch of bad soldering jobs in my garage right now. <laughs> you live and learn, yeah, right? Yeah, I, I learned about those uh, about three weeks ago, actually, when we had some contractors over and they couldn't seal off the uh the the water main from the seat or from from the street and the the guy just had like full city pressure blasting his chest when he when he opened up <laughs> a uh a, a, a hose valve that was actually upstream of the of the house cut off oh my gosh <laughs> must have ripped off his clothes <laughs> in, in any case um <laughs> we can we can return to this topic if, if you're yeah. willing later oh of course uh, <laughs> how did you develop your interest in science and technology did it come from your parents or books or tv how did that happen um i think i mean i've always been interested in knowing more about the world around me ever since i was a kid um and i think it started even before i could remember i mean my son um, you probably will hear him over the course of this interview in the other room, but he's only uh, 21 months and he just, we buy him these encyclopedia books with just pictures of different animals and he starts like memorizing them and he loves just learning about new things and new things that exist in the real world and we'll show him videos of these new animals and he's just like, like fixated on it and I, and I, that resonates with me because I remember being like that when I was a kid learning about the narwhal and that it wasn't a, it was a real animal that, that looked like a unicorn. And, you know. I, I, I believe it's pronounced narwhal. Narwhal, yeah, yeah, <laughs> good, yeah, um, good point. And that, um, I mean, it precipitated into other things like I talked about in my, in the other interview. I mean, I, I love Star Trek, I love Star Wars, I love sci-fi and I mean, I love using my imagination and I love these um, world building um, atmospheres that those um, genres create. But I also like filling in the in-between, you know, like we talked about the Star Trek technical manual and um, by Michael Akuda and the fact that there are physicists that like contributed to that based on theoretical things and came up with explanations on how those things work that really like um, like set me off. I, I love that. Even if it was like pseudoscience, like maybe 20, 30%, the fact that there were things like string theory, like antimatter, antimatter was a real thing. Like I wanted to learn all that stuff. And that's kind of just what, what uh, that curiosity drove me um, into, into engineering and science. So, so, so yeah. So why engineering and not become yeah. a physicist? Good, good point. I mean, um, I always wanted to do something more applied with my hands and I wanted to solve problems that affected people as a whole. Um, to what, as it was described to me originally, and I know this now not to be the case, um, you know, being a graduate PhD, um, applied scientists like physicists and chemists um, really work all, from what it was described to me originally, work on, on um, more theoretical um, constructs and topics and, and they build on those. Whereas uh, a chemical engineer takes those principles that a chemist learns and they apply them to real world problems such as um, industrial problems or environmental problems. And I knew I wanted to be on that end. I, I think the science itself intrigues me and now at my age right now, it's something that um, I'm still very much interested in and maybe later on in life, I'll get more into that. But I always wanted to, to apply them to real world problems. I wanted to 
not just understand like how a distillation column worked, but I wanted to be able to um, have the capacity to design one to for a specific process problem, you know, and that was that was really what um, made me want to be an engineer and not an actual um, not a um, um, a grassroots scientist like a physicist or chemist. So, so I knew that really early on. Yeah. Do you think it was related at all to your interest in working with your hands? Is there something about engineering that is you know attracts people that are sort of fearless with mechanical and electrical devices i think i think it definitely plays a part but it's not it's not a requirement i do know tons of physicists who are amazing with their hands and could really build anything that they wanted because they just understand the um basics so well and and they're just good with their hands so um I think that definitely pushed me in that direction. Do I do that on a daily basis in my job? Not necessarily, um, but does it help me in my daily job? Definitely. Um, and I think that's an important uh, key takeaway for that. Yeah. How did you develop an interest in the semiconductor industry uh, in general? Yeah, so that was actually, um, so, at USC, where I did my undergrad, they had a really cool class called Introduction of Microelectronics, which was a clean room class. And in that class, you spent the semester building um, a microprocessor from a bare wafer all the way through all the litho, ion implantation, etching, uh, photo, uh, lift strip, everything, all the way down to the end of the process. And you built like a few layers. Um, that uh, class, which we were trying to get something like that started uh, at, at, at UC San Diego, uh, Justin and I, but um, um, it's just uh, logistically, it's just hard with our clean room. But, um, but that class really, really piqued my interest in semiconductors. Um, it was a very dangerous class because we worked a lot with HF and we worked, um, the, the TAs would just throw us at this equipment. And I would lie if there weren't, a, if, um, if I said there were no accidents in that, in my lab, um, there were a few, um, but I think what was so satisfying is at the end of that quarter, when I had that microchip in my hands and I, I would have, I, I think it's somewhere around here. I think my, my son actually destroyed it somehow, but I, I think the remnants of it are in the, the house somewhere. But, but when I saw that microchip in my hands and looked under it with the microscope for my final project and did my report and saw those transistors I made, I was like, I was really, really psyched that I was able to manipulate something on such a small level, like by myself, you know, using tools. And that got me interested. I didn't know that I was going to end up in the semi industry, specifically even uh, semiconductor packaging where I'm at right now. But, but I think that's what fueled the fire to do to learn more about that because after that I would go on to 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 pursue nanoengineering at UC San Diego and I would pick that as my major so so I think that definitely that class planted the seeds for what would later be my career and what would be my um, my discipline when I first joined UC San Diego so say you are shopping for you're going to build your own computer or maybe you're going to build an off the shelf computer and you have these different specs on the memory and the microprocess and the CPU and the GPU. What do you know as a chemical engineer doing nanoengineering, nano, nano, nano manufacturing basically uh, that the average educated person wouldn't know? What are you looking for in a microprocessor? I mean, um... When you when you talk about it like that, I kind of look at it as as what would I see that a gamer won't. Um, Actually, and this, yeah. I think the way I, I phrase this might might lead us down a, an area that I, I don't necessarily want to go. Okay, what, go, go ahead. What, what would you know about the? Uh, okay, we're meditating about chocolate. Say right. we're gonna be mindful about chocolate. We take the the square and we put it in our mouth and we think about the. Uh, the cacao farmers and the sunlight <laughs> striking the leaves and the 
the people who uh, you know fermented the the, <laughs> the yeah. beans, and then we think about the artisan chocolatier mm -hmm. and all of the uh, actually the chemical engineering that goes into giving right. it that glossy sheen, yeah. and then the the packaging and so on, and then it ends up in the grocery right. store. And so, if you're going to be mindful about a microprocessor, what would what would you be? What would you know about it, regardless of like of performance specs? Right. Um... I think, um, yeah, I guess so. So what we're what we're trying to get at really is like, what do I see that the that the, the microprocessor that the off the shelf person wouldn't see, and what's gone I, into it? The yeah, a lot. I mean, technology. I mean, it's kind of an emotional thing for me to actually bring it up. That's why I'm kind of pausing a little bit because um, each technical node that we we punch out at Intel. There's, I mean, there's a hundred thousand people that work at Intel, and we need every single one of them to to make the technical leaps that we do. And um, I think people tend to forget that um, that those microchips, um, you know, are made in mass, like um, uh, over, you know, at, at, at many factories across the world. And in order to get it to the dollar amount that someone gets it off the shelf, um, there is a lot of work that goes into making sure that we have a 99.9999% um, success rate with building those transistors. And it goes actually farther than that in terms of like the, the point nines, you know? I, I've heard um, it was one part in 10 to the 18, something like that. Yeah, it's the crazy. error rate. Exactly, yeah. And then and then even within that noise, that's where we select our um, um, I9, I10, um, you know, um, uh, distinction, which makes it a, 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 a higher performance processor. So, um, it is like an, a massive endeavor to to actually get each one of those out, um, those technical nodes, and just the difference between an i7 and an i5. Like um, those, what many people don't know is that the when you buy a chip off of the shelf and it's an i5, i7, or i9, and so forth, that those aren't different actual designs. Those are just like those are proportional to like the the uh, the yield of the transistors, which means that those an i7 is, um, when you compare it to an i5, is more of like the, the one out of every 10 that meets the test requirements and meets the yield um, requirements that make it um, higher performance. So we set those aside. And then every couple batches, we'll get an i10, one that's like above like the end, like above like the, uh, the creme de la creme of, um, of, uh, of microchips. And then we set that aside and, and so forth. So, so it's, it's pretty pretty interesting that that part is actually um, statistical you know like uh, we we don't actually make those on purpose it's like we get we kind of get a little lucky and then we make one that has a little bit better yield and has more transistors that are functioning and thus has higher performance and then we set that aside so so yeah that's that's kind of something that uh, that I um, that kind of resonates with me when I when I when I see a, a chip. Uh, I literally um, had no idea that there was that much variability and yeah. the, so these are like, like the I-5 is like factory seconds. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So when there must be a lot of redundancy then on the chip if you have transistors that are underperforming or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, blocks of yeah of logic that that are serving yeah. one purpose and yeah and that's it's kind of like a living thing that can kind of correct itself and even with some of our fpga the field programmable grid array um uh, chips that that are basically like swiss army knives in terms of um uh, of logic those things our designers make those so verse in such a versatile way that you could use it for any pretty much any type of algorithm and if you don't have enough yielding transistors, you can get your logic to work, um, albeit slower, because it has to find a less optimal path. But, but, um, but it will, you know, find a way to work. So yeah, those i fives are kind of like, yeah, we'll take all these oranges, but this nice, pretty orange right here, you're going in the i seven bucket. And then every once in a while, we get that glowing orange. That's just you can smell the nice orange. 
uh, sent from um, uh, from like 20 feet away, and and that'll be like an uh, an I nine. Um, so that part's so, interesting. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So so nanoscopically, what mm -hmm. are what is the origin of the error in a transistor? Is it a photolithography error where there's yeah. like lineage blur, or is it that the dopant density is not right in that particular part of the silicon? Yeah. Or there's a, a grain boundary or something. What what do you what happens? Yeah. It it could be any. So all of everything you just mentioned is has its own failure code on, in our system, and and the answer is all of the above can lead to a transistor uh, not working. I mean, it could just be shorted naturally because the gate is not properly um, uh, manufactured, or you know the litho just wasn't right, or there was some offset. It could be some um, FM, some foreign materials is what the acronym is, that, you know, um, just made its way into the process and called some, cost uh, some, some yield loss. Um, but that's really, and then it also could just be thermals. Um, the way that the um, chip is put on the motherboard and whatever system it's working with, if it's a Lenovo or an HP, if there's too much heat dissipated on one side, all of those transistors can be past the uh, you know the thermal barrier and open, and 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 that could be the reason why it doesn't it doesn't function right and and ends up being a, a lower end. But it's um but yeah it's all it's all statistical yield. I mean we get it to a certain maturity, and then uh, we hand it off to HVM, and then once it's a an HVM, then it's a statistic. Oh, oh, high volume high, manufacturing. High volume. Yeah, yeah. So HVM. Um, so I work in R and D, um, which is uh, really proof of concept um, going into LVM, which is low volume manufacturing. Um, and then after low volume, it goes into HVM, which is production, and that's um, uh, where a lot of the numbers um, problems can come into effect, like things that we wouldn't see in R and D, like proof of concept when we're making um 10 chip packages or something like that it doesn't show up because it's a it's a 0.001 percent chance that only comes out when we've made a million of them or something like that so so that's a big part of it too so yeah yeah it's all you numbers mentioned you were in the uh the packaging group what does packaging yeah. mean in semiconductors right. <laughs> so i've gotten a few friends hired uh here in this department uh at ucsd and a couple and some of them, uh, and uh, usc also um, and initially, when I say, hey, you want to work in Intel's packaging department, they thought that they're going to be putting things in boxes in, a <laughs> in our shipping department or something. Um, but semiconductor packaging is an industry that I didn't even know about when I, when I did my internship uh, in 2013, 2014. Um, so there's a part of the microchip um, um, called the package, which actually supports the microprocessor. Um, when I have my motherboard um, that's actually on my um, um, on my laptop, and you, let me just bring a laptop. I just have laptops lying around. <laughs> um, you have your motherboard and you have your processor that's in here. Um, actually, hold, can you hold on one second? I'll do you one better. Actually, I actually have a, a substrate that I have right here. Um, so. This is what a, a, a substrate looks like. And um, when I'm referring to the packaging, um, the silicon chip itself is only a part of the microprocessor. The silicon chip actually goes in this area right here. And this entire assembly is what gets put onto the motherboard. Now, the silicon chip with the substrate is called the package. And every computer chip company has a division that works on the packaging. Because you can never put your microprocessor just on your motherboard. It just, the, the design rules just don't work. If you're trying to get a 10 nanometer process to work with something where the, um, your LGA pins are a couple millimeters um, uh, wide, it, the scaling just doesn't work. It's just going to be um, a piece of silicon lying on something that's, that can't connect to it. So um, we make something called the substrate. Um, so the substrate does uh, many things. Um, it is its main purpose is it's a size transformer. It gets those 10 nanometer transistors and fans them out to a, um, a length scale that can actually interface with your motherboard, which is more on the millimeter and micron scale. 
Um, it also provides mechanical stability to the die. You know, silicon's very uh, fragile. If you um, get a piece of silicon and you drop it, it's very brittle and it cracks. So it needs some mechanical support in order to keep itself from cracking on your computer. Um, another thing too is nowadays with our cloud computing and our um, all these apps that people run on their phones, um, a microchip processor can't just have one chip. Um, it usually needs multiple to do many different jobs. So in order to get all of those chips together um, and functioning as a single unit, you need a package to um, interface them all together. And you can connect them either through the routing that's um, in the package, uh, the substrate itself, or you can use other pieces of silicon. Um, and that's called um, 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 silicon interposer or 3D interconnect technology. Intel does something specific called EMIB, which is they use silicon dyes and they actually put them inside the substrate and use them to bridge uh, multiple silicon pieces. It's an Intel proprietary technology, and that's something that I work on a lot. Um, but that whole, everything that has to do with this guy right here, the substrate, um, is called um, um, packaging, and that's what, that's what I work on. Um, it also doesn't go on just like this. Um, when you put the die on here, you actually have to put a lid on, which those of you who are gamers know that that lid um, serves the purpose of dissipating heat. Um, and that gets connected using a glue that's called thermal interface material, Tim. Um, all of that is the, um, the package as a whole. And then once that's all put together, um, if you have an LGA um, substrate, which is land grid array, then you can just snap this bad boy onto a computer. If it's like um, something called um, BGA, ball grid array, then you have to solder it onto your motherboard. And then once it's on, it never comes off. Um, but yeah, so this, um, that's what semiconductor packaging is. This um, substrate right here is where the bulk of um, R&D is happening in the semiconductor industry. The reason for that is the last 50 years, we've been following something called Moore's Law, which says that every 18 months, um, we have the size of our transistors and we double the density of transistors on a microchip. Um, that law has been um, met this last half century with no problem at all until we've gotten to about 14 to 20 nanometers. It's at that point now that we're experiencing um, effects in physics that we never experienced beyond um, above 20 nanometers. Things like quantum tunneling, which you learn a lot about in nanoengineering, and um, nanoscopic um, uh, thermal um, uh, phenomenon that you also learn about in nanoengineering. It's just the simple fact that physics at the quantum scale doesn't work the same way as physics at the macro scale works. And for that reason, um, it's starting to stall Moore's law. Um, now it's seeming like every 36 months we're having it or every, uh, every 40 months even, because we went from 20 to 14 nanometers and now we're at 10 and going into seven. And, it's, and the progress is very slow. And frankly, the benefit of, of um, increasing the density of transistors isn't really there like it was when we were um, up at 40 or 50 nanometers. And the reason for that is when you have so many transistors in such a small area, they heat up really fast. And when they heat up really fast, they, um, they start to turn each other off because of the... Um, 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 because of thermals, basically electrons have too much thermal energy and they jump the transistor gate and it, it causes an open. Um, so where we would expect 50% benefit um, when we half the size of the transistor, we're no longer getting that because of uh, quantum effects. So going back to the original point, most of the performance benefit um, that we're seeing in, in, in uh, microchips today is actually coming from the package, which has been neglected for the last half century. This little piece of, um, of plastic, it's made of just epoxy and copper, is dirt cheap to make. It's really easy to make, um, and the design rules are very forgiving. Um, it uses a different process than what we use for silicon technology. Um, and luckily, that process is, is a lot cheaper. Um, and for that reason, we haven't made many improvements over the last 50 years. It's only in the last um, five or 10 years that we've really started to look at the package, or I'm sorry, the, the substrate part of the package, 
and start to look at the design rules in here and what we can change to help optimize and and um, and improve the uh, the power of the processor. Um, so what, also, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. What what tools do you use to do that, and what uh, what's like a typical day like? Uh, yeah. I guess pre COVID. Yeah. So um, so I work in the. Um, uh, we have a pilot factory uh, at my site at Intel. We're the only um, substrate factory in the entire United States. We make tons of silicon chips in the US. Intel makes them, AMD makes them um, here in the US, but no one makes substrates. Intel actually doesn't make its own substrates. It outsources to Japanese um, and, and Asian vendors. Um, so, we have relied on them. Apple also relies on them, AMD, all these other companies. We rely on these Asian um, um, sub suppliers to make our uh, substrates for each other or for ourselves. And then we put the dye and the substrate together here in the US. Um, but we actually made a pilot factory about, um, it was about 10 years ago that it started. And it's the only, Intel is the only one that has a substrate factory. Um, again, in the United States. And that's actually where um, I do a lot of my work and collaborate with, uh, with folks on. Um, a bulk of my work is also working with those Asian sub suppliers to improve their technology. Um, it's really um, an intense collaborative effort for me to advise them what to do based on what we're doing in our pilot factory. And that's kind of the dynamic and the tools that I use. Um, I'm no longer, um, boots on the ground, meaning I don't own a tool anymore, a specific part of the process, which many engineers start out um, doing. Um, I'm more in charge of a specific area um, or a specific set of processes in the, uh, in the substrate um, involving the core, the, which is the center of the substrate, um, and the, um, uh, the buildup material, the material that actually we layer on uh, to make the substrate. So on a day-to-day -day basis, um, I'm designing DOEs and, um, and asking our Asian suppliers and our uh, factory uh, folks at our pilot factory to, to execute those DOEs so we can gather the data, analyze it, and then make recommendations um, on new products. The products that I'm working on are gonna come out right now, uh, 2025. So I'm usually working about four to five years ahead of um, of where we're at chronologically. So, um, so yeah, a day to day. I I spend a lot of time behind the computer. I'd say I spend about um, these days. I spend about 10 percent of my time in the factory itself, or working in a lab trying to look at a new material and see if it's viable or it can meet some um, business interest of ours. But uh, but yeah, that's where my um, my time allocation is recently. Wasn't always like that though. There was a time when I was in the factory almost 24 seven. Do you have, uh, you have direct reports, um, people that are in the factory that you work with, like people who are fresh out of school? Um, not right now, actually. Um, I do have a lot of people that I'm responsible for with in terms of uh, career development. Intel kind of has a system where you get a mentor and a mentee it's called like a buddy system where you're responsible for their onboarding and their learning um, for the first six months or so of their uh, their career. <clears throat> um, but as far as direct reports like Intel um, uh, employees that I have to fill out their uh, um, their yearly reviews uh, currently don't have any, which is um, I actually like it that way. Um, I love people, um, but I found that based on my previous experience with managing people, that um, the way Intel is structured, you can spend a lot of your time managing people and not get any um, uh, get any um, I guess what's the word? Not praise, but um, it's hard to get uh, a lot of build your technical reputation when all you're doing is um, uh, focusing on people doesn't mean that it's a bad thing, but for the career path that I've chosen, which is um, specifically, I want to be a technical um, uh, and individual contributor. Um, I need to be working on my, uh, my technical contributions. Uh, if I wanted to do management, 
um, I would be, yeah, of course, focusing on people and grand and bigger uh, business objectives as a whole with the company. But, but that's um, kind of what the career path that I've chosen uh, as it currently stands. So, so yeah, we could talk more about that. But there's two paths that you can choose. Yeah. Itself. So, as a as an individual contributor, what are mm -hmm. your career goals within Intel? Yeah. So. Um, my career goal is to be, um, it's called an Intel fellow, which is kind of like a tenure track professor. <laughs> you know, you can, you have more flexibility and freedom to pursue uh, specific projects uh, that are aligned with Intel's uh, strategic business objectives. Um, but you, uh, you also have a lot of flexibility on how you execute on that. Um, and the reason for that is because when you become an Intel fellow, you've already demonstrated that um, you're so valuable to the company and you've made so many technical contributions that you are you have the capability to, to do that without any supervision or anything like that. Um, there's about a couple dozen uh, Intel fellows in our, in our business unit. Um, but um, but that's the end goal for me. If you and to kind of parallel that with what um, the on the on the business side, um, if you wanted to do management track, uh, the end goal for that is a uh, vice president, which is you know most people know how that is. You're you basically in charge of groups of people that are in charge of other groups of people, and and you're really um, directing people as a whole to um, to get Intel's uh, strategic business objectives completed. So, so yeah, that's, uh, that's currently my goal. Can't guarantee that that'll be the same next year because I kind of get a little um, antsy with what I'm doing <laughs> every now and then, but, um, but that's what I'm happy doing uh, uh, right now. Yeah. So you, you were at Intel for quite a long time um, in 2014 before, yeah. so you did a, a long internship there um, yeah. with a uh, sort of MS undergraduate and MS level training. Yeah. What is the difference in tasks at a company like Intel between somebody who comes in with, an, with a BS uh, and or MS and somebody who comes in with a PhD? Yeah, so it's, um, it's different in the sense that, um, well, it also depends on where you end up. Um, some business groups are different than others. You know, some groups are organized so that everybody um, in the same, no matter what your degree is, is kind of doing the same type of work. But in the business units that are technically oriented at Intel, um, like technology development, um, PhDs are more responsible for R&D and the bachelor's level is more responsible for tool ownership, process ownership, and um, um, making sure our HVM tools are uh, up to production and, and, and working correctly. And I've experienced that at multiple companies. When I worked in between undergrad and graduate, um, I worked as a process engineer at Baxter, which is a pharmaceutical company. Uh, in Los Angeles, and I had a bachelor's level job, and a lot of it was process engineering. I was responsible for a specific um, process unit, and my job was to install it, qualify it, and get it to a point where it's working at, um, uh, at a manufacturing level. These days, um, as a PhD, it, my work contrasts a lot with what my scope was back when I was a, a bachelor's level. Um, I'm responsible for a lot more and the, the level of depth that my, I'm expected to have for technical knowledge is a lot deeper. It's not just surface level. Um, I'm expected to know a lot of things at the, at the drop of a hat. And um, when I don't, um, it can kind of be very, very apparent. And it can, and the thing about Intel, the way it's structured my bosses and my boss's bosses are also PhDs. And not only are they PhDs, they are also PhDs with up to 20, 30 years of experience. So if I'm saying something weird about mass transfer that um, it physically does not make any sense, um, they will call me out on it and they will stop it right then there um, and focus on how my principles are, are backwards and so and, facts and theory yeah. is facts and theory are important. They um, are, yeah. Exactly. Because you know, I often hear um, 
some sometimes on Twitter, sometimes from real real life people that uh, there's too much focus on you know memorization and and so on. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't really agree. I think that there's not a distinct boundary between knowledge and memorization. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it's you know it's good to it's good to know that it, there's value in knowing things that uh, that you're not going to take five minutes to Google. Or, yeah. or you know an hour <laughs> to, yeah totally to yeah and i and i agree with you and and those are those are important things and i look for those things when i'm hiring people um too um there have been interviews where and i've actually i've texted you about these interviews when if the fundamentals are not on par and i'm testing for those fundamentals um or if they go off in a direction and they are trying to um, bat me away with uh, confidence and and bravado, um, I I sink it in deeper. I I, I double down on it and um, and I let people know that it is okay to not know things at Intel. Um, you know, it it is okay um, to a certain degree as long as you're willing to learn from your mistakes and um, and learn. You know, as long as you have that willingness to learn, you're safe. But if you are content in your ignorance, and if you are, um, in fact, want to um, uh, just pro like just, um, you know, perpetually go on, you know, with with these ignorant pockets um, in your um, shoveling in your, BS. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Then your career really isn't going to go anywhere and people will start to isolate you because they will not be able to trust you. And and that's the one thing I tell new hire. I mean, I've never actually um, told anybody that, um, you know, on the spot that they're not going to get hired because they're lying about something. But I let them know that that's something that, in, that you know, not just Intel, but just businesses in general um, really, especially technical companies really need to put their faith in you for, you know, as a scientist, they are, they are depending on you to give them an answer. And if you, um, cannot with certainty give a good answer that, you know, based on your technical knowledge, then your use really devalues, uh, or devalues quickly. So, so knowledge really is power. It really is. And, um, the more you have of it, the more valuable you are to companies, you know, and I think, and like I said, it's different for different, and I think that's the reason why people on Twitter and social media and then in, and in general have these types of opinions, because oftentimes they fall in a position where it's kind of on the border of science and, the, and business. Um, you know, their role is something like supply chain, where they're responsible for, um, for technical materials, but they're not really doing anything uh, science-y or um, anything in chemistry or physics or anything like that. It's more surface level. And for those positions, I would argue, yeah, you don't really need to know what fixed second law is or what um, the, the Boltzmann, um, uh, Boltzmann's law is or what Planck's constant is off the top of your head. You know, you'll be perfectly fine. Um, but if you really want an R&D job, you know, that's something where that's where it separates one class of individual for the other, you know, and that's where the PhD at our company at least is preferred because you've already demonstrated the ability to take a project um, that's unique and take it from start to finish, take what you've learned and publish that, you know, and that's, that is really what they're hiring for. That's whatever it is that you published on. Um, that's about 10% of why they'll get hired for the job, but really taking it from start to finish um, and contributing to your field um, is what people are looking for and what I'm specifically looking for when I, when I want to hire a new engineer. So yeah. at the undergraduate level, because a lot of, because, well, we're gearing this discussion for, um, mm -hmm. for undergraduate degree right. holders. What, what right. do you think they should know about the, what, what, what are some misconceptions that undergraduate engineers have when they're doing job interviews and maybe what is not part of their engineering curriculum that you think they should, yeah, they should learn before going into it? Yeah. Um, definitely people skills. Um, if you are the smartest person on the planet, 
uh, and you would do perfect on all your exams. That is that is awesome. But if you are a jerk, <laughs> then it cancels out all of that because unless you are doing a one person startup, you will always have to work with other people. And that skill is indispensable. And that's something I don't think people really um, focus on in undergrad. And really, I kind of focused on it just because I like people and I'm a social person. But working with people on, in, on projects and doing presentations with people as a group and, um, and working with people to accomplish a common goal are indispensable um, skills and something that I think um, most folks do focus on, but maybe it isn't publicized enough in our undergraduate curriculum. The science, I mean, you and everybody, uh, you know, at UCSD, does a wonderful job of, uh, of, of, you know, demonstrating what you need to know on a technical basis, but oftentimes it's up to us, the students, to fill in the blanks on what we need to do to work with other people. And that's something I find that's con that's missing. Like on paper, a candidate looks amazing, but then when we put them in a position, they just cannot work with people because they just, they're used to working alone or they just hate people or something, you know, or something odd like that. And and that is something that, um, you know, you, if, if that is your, um, your flavor, then you really need to think about what it is that you want to do as a career. Because if you want to be a scientist, scientists um, always work better in groups, unless you're Nicholas Tesla, um, then, you know, you're most likely going to do better as a group than as an individual. Um, and, um, and yeah, I think that's one of the uh, the key things that I would reiterate uh, that that people should should work on those soft skills, like you call. I mean, you've said in your presentations, like soft skills are very very important. Um, you know, being able to communicate is another one that's super important. That um, you've given a lot of great presentations that have helped me um, as well. Being able to effectively deliver. Um, a message in a concise, articulate, um, and interesting manner is is indis is, I mean, worth its weight in gold these days. So, so if you can do that, that's um, I think that's awesome. I actually, and one thing I want to reiterate uh, uh, too that if you still can have a prolific career if you decide to go into industry as a bachelor's, and you still can do R and D at a bachelor's level. It just depends on where you want to work um, and what company you would want to work for. We have, um, a, we have bachelor's uh, level um, candidates in our, in our group right now. And I've also helped hire, hire them. And um, it depends on the job that you want to do. And we do have um, R&D level um, uh, positions for, for bachelor's um, students. And they have those at other, at other companies. So I, wanna, I really want to drive home that if you want to do R&D, um, getting a PhD definitely helps you do something um, um, specifically focused on that, but it doesn't, it's not um, an absolute uh, requirement. You still can find a position. So I just want to make that so that way it's not dis discouraging that, oh, if I need, if I really want to do R&D, I need to get a PhD. Not necessarily, but it does help. So yeah, just wanted to touch upon that. Yeah, that's great. I think going back to your comment on mm -hmm. uh, on people skills, I think some people erroneously think that they just have bad people skills and they're awkward and they feel like they're not good in a conversation. Um, and I sort of felt that way too for, and feel it fairly often. Um, but I think people have a, an incorrect like mean field approximation of their own social abilities when really what your, the perception of you as a uh, as a team team member comes down to individual, a collection of individual interactions. And there are right ways and wrong ways to approach, you know, an individual interaction. Um, like, for example, I was reading uh, a, like a language guide. I was going to a new country and it, it said, this is how you, you know, you approach somebody and you ask them, how are they doing before you ask them where the bathroom is? <laughs> and I'm like, well, that's that's really great advice for international travel, but really that's good advice for all interactions ever. <laughs> and, Definitely. 
<laughs> yeah. So uh, you know, you can you can choose, you know, to take an interest in what you know what you know somebody is going through, what they what happened to them yesterday. You can take an interest in teaching somebody about you know what you're trying to do before just asking them for something, um, uh, before you know fulfill, fulfilling your needs without uh, you know explaining why uh, why why you need things the way you do. So. Yeah, there are yeah. there are there are right ways and wrong ways to to approach these interactions, and and yeah. no one is hopeless is my you know my point. Yeah, definitely, and I think um, it's um, I feel like people actually get a joy out of it as well too. I think um, I've there have been countless people that I've met that initially were very shy, um, very uh, introverted. And, you know, over the years, they've developed their, uh, their, their um, skills, you know, soft skills at work and stuff. And, and the more that they interact with people and learn to, um, you know, to streamline that, act, that, um, um, that interaction, the more they actually, I, I've found that they have learned that they enjoy it, you know, that helping other people, learning things from other people, um, and just talking to other people and, and, you know, building confidence um, really like um, brings a lot of joy to their life, you know, and it's kind of a self-feeding cycle. You know, the more that you enjoy it, the more you want to do it. And the more you can get joy out of your workplace, which I think at the end of the day is what we all want to do, right? Like um, we just want to be happy doing what we, what we're doing. And yeah. if we get paid for it, all the better, right? <laughs> so, yeah. I think that's a, uh, a fantastic note to end on. Um, yeah. Brandon, thank you so much for doing this. And I look forward to uh, chatting maybe a third time. Yeah, I'd love to. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. All right. Great, Brandon. Take care.